Sí, sí. Uh, so my talk is uh, beautiful Python. I did this QR code for you to get the slides, but I don't know if it's going to work for you. Let's see. I don't know. So I guess the reason why I was I had the honor of being invited, and I want to thank uh, a lot to the organization, Cynthia, and all the volunteers that make this conference work. I think the reason why I, I was invited to come all the way from Brazil to China was because I wrote uh, this book. I am very happy because the book is uh, selling well and people like it. It has been translated to several languages. And today at noon on the third floor, uh, I will be signing books. Uh, Turing will be selling the books and I will sign books over there and also take pictures of you with, with, with you if you like okay and I'm working on the, the second edition of the book but that's going to be only on the second semester of the of next year okay uh, all right so let's uh, get started uh, this talk is about beauty but usually we think about beauty applied to visual things. But there is also beauty in conceptual things, in abstract things, in machines, in uh, bridges, which is a kind of machine. A bridge is a kind of machine. And uh, I like very much the design that was created at the Bauhaus School. Uh, and Walter Gropius, who was the founder of Bauhaus, uh, w once wrote that to love and create beauty are conditions to happiness. And I like very much the fact that the first line of the Zen of Python is about beauty, right? So this, this uh, concern about beauty is part of the language from the beginning. Um, okay, what are the things that I think are beautiful in Python? The first thing that I think is beautiful is simple syntax. Not this. But this is an example of a very simple program that does this, okay? I like to compare this syntax that is now very familiar because a lot of programming languages copied the, language, the syntax from, from C. Java copied from C, JavaScript copied from Java and C-sharp copied from Java. So this is a very influential syntax. And maybe we think that it's easy because we are familiar with it. Like we have learned to interpret the chess pieces, right? What, what they mean. However, I'm gonna show you this chessboard is one that I like much more. Uh, it was designed by Joseph Hartwig, one of the uh, uh, artists that worked at Bauhaus. And I think it's beautiful because it's simpler and it also is easier to think about how to remember how the pieces move. If you look at the, the knight, the knight is shaped like an L. And the piece is very interesting because no matter how you put it, there's always an L on top. Okay. And the, the bishop is shaped like an X, so it reminds you of the way it moves. And then you have the king. The king has this uh, cube rotated, so it suggests the fact that it moves in uh, orthogonally and diagonally. And the queen is a, a replacement of the cube on top with the sphere. And the sphere is always associated with a female form. Right, the, the the circle and the female, the and the sphere, is a female form. Anyway, so I think this is beautiful. It's easier to construct. Uh, yeah, the machinery necessary to build a, a chessboard like this is much simpler than the other one. And I also think it's easier to learn to play chess on a on a on a board like this. So this chessboard is like this program. Take a look at the difference. The programs do the same thing, right? But the C program has a lot of noise. 
a lot of incidental complexity. Uh, one of the best documents to understand the philosophy of Python, besides the Zen of Python, is PEP 3099, which was published uh, a long time ago, in 2006, and it's, it's about things that will not change in Python 3000. At, this, at the time, it was before Python 3.0 was released, of the future of Python was called Python 3000 because the developers didn't want to commit to a time, so they said, oh, this is the Python that will be around on, in the year 3000. Uh, but anyway, in this document, there's a lot of interesting things about you know, the, the things that will not change because they are part of the philosophy of the language. And one of the things that it says there is that the parser will never be more complicated than it is today. So that creates restrictions on the kinds of syntax that can be added because the parser is the simplest kind of parser used in programming languages, right? So that's why, that's one reason, maybe that's the most visual reason why I feel that Python is like a modernist language, right? Like this is a, a modernist uh, chessboard. And of course, this has to do with the, one of the other lines of the Zen of Python, simple is better than complex. But here's the thing, modernism in this sense that I'm using doesn't have anything to do with age, okay? It has to do with the philosophy of design of trying to do simple things, but simple is also not simplistic, it's different, right? And the best example, I think the most modern game that I know is this one. Although it's an ancient game, uh, it is a game that is extremely modern in, in its conception, in its idea. The pieces are very simple, the board is simple, but, and the rules are simpler. This is very interesting. The rules of Weichi are simpler than the rules, rules of chess. However, the game is more sophisticated, is more complicated than chess. So, simple is better than complex, but complex is better than complicated. Okay? Uh, I would say that uh, Go is more complex than chess, but it's not more complicated. Chess is more complicated. Chess has more rules. Okay? Now let's talk about another feature of Python that I really like. And it's, uh, okay, like the formal name of this in other languages, in, we, we in Python just call it the for loop, okay? But in other languages they call it the enhanced for. So here's the thing. That same program in C, if you had to, had to write that program in Java, before Java 5, you, have to, you had to write this. Notice that it's the, pretty much the same syntax as in C, right? And it's interesting because Java was created 20 or 30 years after C, right? So, but they repeated this. And there's another phrase by Walter Gropius of the Bauhaus that I like. Specialists are people who always repeat the same mistakes, right? So, uh, they were, the, the creators of Java were trying to make something that was familiar to specialists. The creators of, or the creator of Python was not interested in making it familiar to specialists. It was, he was interested in making it familiar to everyone. Okay? Anyway, so after a while, Java incorporated in Java 5 this syntax uh, that they call the enhanced for, and it's still, it's a little bit more complicated than the Python program, but it's close. But it took them a while to get there. Now, the, the, the thing that's important to understand is this was, uh, this way of working uh, was not invented by Python at all. Uh, it was invented by this woman, Barbara Liskov. I, I, I guess, uh, many of you know the, uh, her name uh, is the letter L in the solid principle, right? Solid. There is a, the letter L is the Liskov substitution principle, right? 
so uh, and so she is famous for that. But she is also uh, she also created uh, a, a programming language called Clue. And Clue was not a success in the market, but it was very influential. And one of the things that Clue had was this syntax for, for the for loop, right? Uh, very similar to what we have in Python. Now, in order for this syntax to work, there is a requirement. This object here, whatever leaves x returns, needs to be iterable, right? And it's the same thing in Python. What the object that you put in that position has to be an iterable, okay? Now, uh, the interesting thing is, in Python, not only we have iterable objects, but we can also create iterable objects. And I say this because some languages don't offer this flexibility. For instance, in C, there is no concept of iterables at all. That's why you have to manipulate that index or pointers or something like that. And in Go, which is a new language, in some regards, it's not as modern <laughs> because Go has a concept of iterable, but only five uh, types that come with the language are iterable. If you want to have your own collection, you want, you want to create your own data structure that is iterable, you won't be able to do that in, in, in Go. Go does not allow the Go programmer to create something that can be iterated automatically using the for range syntax. Okay, so what is an iterable, right? An, an iterable is something that is capable of being iterated. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about that, right? There is the iterator pattern that was actually formalized 20 years after the concept of an iterable appeared in, in uh, Clue. Uh, the iterator pattern was formalized in this uh, book so that people using languages that did not have iterables automatically or in, embedded in the language could implement that pattern, right? And uh, the pattern has to do with the iterator. There is a, uh, the iterable here is the, the, the list and the skip lists are iterables, and they work together with iterators. The idea is that the iterator is an object that provides a way to access the elements of an aggregate object without exposing the, the structure, right? So that woman, when she wants to uh, iterate over an array list or an array, which are two different data structures in Java, she, all she needs to know is that she can get an iterator from the data structure, and all the iterators have the same interface, which is only a next method. So that's what the iterator does. It creates a simple interface to iterate that doesn't require you to understand how the data is organized, okay? In Python, uh, the way this works is uh, <coughs> the Python uh, looks at that object, an iterable, and it obtains from the iterable an iterator, right? This is an important concept to keep separated. There is the iterable and there is the iterator, and usually it's not a good idea to implement both in the same class, okay? So anyway, how do we implement an iterator, an, an iterable in Python? I'm gonna show a very simple example. Imagine there is a class called train that allows me to iterate over an instance. So T is an instance of train, and I say for car in T, print car, and I have the three cars, all right? So uh, this is the classic way to implement it. On the top, you have the iterable, and the bottom, you have the iterator. In Python, you have to, the, the, the iterable has to implement the underscore, underscore, iter, underscore, underscore. So to avoid saying underscore so many times, I'm going to use the shortcut of saying dunder. Right, so the train implements the dunder iter method. 
and the Dunder iter method returns an iterator which then implements the Dunder next method. And that's how it works, right? Now, this is uh, no longer the best way of doing this in Python because since the year 2001, we can implement this using just the Dunder iter method on the class. And that's because it has the yield keyword inside the Dunder iter there, there's the yield keyword. The yield keyword means that when this method is called, the caller gets an, iter an iterator. Actually, a generator. But the generator implements the iterator uh, interface. Right? So you don't need to implement the whole iterator anymore. Right? I think this is super elegant. And it means that you don't need to use that design pattern. We, have, we don't use, need to use that design pattern in Python anymore since the year 2001. So that's an example of simple is better than complex. Uh, the, f the way the for loop works is simple for the end user. And there is some complexity if you have to learn about the concept of a generator and how the yield keyword works. But this complication is, this, this complexity is better than the complication of implementing the whole iter iterator class. Right? This all works because of another thing that I think is fantastic in Python, and, it's, and that's the special methods, right? So the special methods in Python, they uh, are used in many different contexts. So uh, one other definition that you can have for an iterable in Python is this. An iterable is an object from, each, from which the iter function can build an iterator. So the, usually, you don't use the iter function, okay? It's rare that we need to use the iter, fun the iter function, but Python itself uses it. And what does the iter function do? It, it tries to obtain an iterator from the iterable by doing one of two things. The first thing it tries to see is it, sees, it, it checks whether the object implements the Dunder iter method. And if it does, it calls that and expects that the return will be an iterator or a generator, okay? But it's very interesting that Python does another thing. The iter function in Python and the for loop, which uses it, does another thing. If you implement a class that implements Dunder get item, which is the special method used to access items using square brackets, you know, when you're assessing an array, an element of the array using the index, uh, that's uh, the Dunder get item method that works. So, if uh, the Python interpreter de determines that the object doesn't have the Dunder iter method, then it has a, a, a fallback. It has a plan B, and the plan B is to see whether the object has a Dunder, Dunder get item, and then to try and use the Dunder get item to retrieve the elements one by one, giving uh, indexes from zero, one, two, three. So the Python interpreter in this case constructs on the fly a new uh, iterator for that object. There's a lot of special methods. Uh, this is a table from my book. Log, uh, one of the differences, I think there is no, I don't think there's, uh, at least when I wrote my book, I don't think there was any other Python book in the market that covered special methods in chapter one. Because I, I wrote the book for people who were already using Python and wanted to understand the language better. And I think a key thing to understand the language better is to understand the special methods. That's why in my book I start the first chapter talking about special methods. So there's, a, there's a, a, several of them, but one common question that people ask is, why is the len, the Dunder len method? And sometimes I've seen uh, Python code from beginners where the person writes, my collection dot Dunder len, open close parenthesis, instead of calling len of my collection, right? This is a mistake. It works, actually. It does work. 
but it's slower and unnecessary. And I will explain why. So now we talk about the Zen of Lin. Okay, so the idea is, uh, the reason why we call Lin of X instead of X dot Lin in Python is a perform performance optimization. The, 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 the length of a sequence is a very critical piece of information that the interpreter needs at all times, right? So, if you think about, for instance, in Java, uh, arrays in Java don't, la don't have a linked method. They have a linked field. Remember that? You don't call myarray.length open close parentheses. It's myarray.length because it's a property. Because they want to, to make fast. A, a method call in any object-oriented programming language is an expensive uh, operation to do. So, the, 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 way the, the, the way Guido solved this problem of how do we make uh, it fast to get the length of the objects that are basic in the language, like strings, lists, arrays, that are essential to the operation of the language, how do we make it fast to get the length of those methods, but at the same time, we don't introduce an inconsistency so that when I create a, my collection, I want the len function to create, to work with it too. So the way it works is, when Python sees len of x, what it does is it looks at x and it sees if, it, if x is a built-in uh, data structure like string, list, tuple, array, set, etc., or if it's an extension written in C or Rust, something that is linked to the interpreter, and written in, other lang in another language. In that case, there is a structure in memory, a struct in memory called pyvar object. That is, uh, every object that has a variable length has that structure. And, and, the, and, and the length function looks at that structure, and there is a field called ob size, and that's where it reads the length. So len of x, when, len, when, when x is a string, is super fast because it's just a matter of looking up a field in a struct in memory. There's no method call. But if the object is not implemented in C, is not an extension or is not a built-in, then in order to provide consistency, Python has this plan B. And the plan B in this case is to read, to check if the object has a Dunderland method and then call that method, right? So that's why, uh, calling Dunderlen on a string is slower than calling the len of the string. Because len of the string is resolved in a special way by the, is computed in a special way by the interpreter. But if you do uh, my string dot under, under, under len open close parentheses, then there is a method call involved and it's going to be slower. Okay? So this has to do with other items of the Zen of Python, like special cases aren't special enough to break the rules, although practicality beats purity, right? So Python is a practical language. Another thing that I think is very interesting in Python, and it's probably one of the reasons why Python is so popular for machine learning, is the fact that Python has operator overloading, right? For anybody who works with mathematics, with linear algebra, statistics and so on, it's very useful to have operator overloading in the, in the language so that I can multiply two matrices by saying M star N instead of doing uh, function calls and method calls, right? So there's a lot, of, a lot of special methods that have to do with operator overloading and I'm going to show an example uh, but I think it's really nice. Uh, how many, how many of you uh, use sets in Python commonly? All right, yeah, great. The majority doesn't use sets, and I bet that th those of you who don't use sets are wasting time <laughs> because sets solve lots of problems uh, in a very high-level way. But one reason why I think a lot of programmers don't use sets a lot is because some other languages that are more popular 
uh, don't have sets that are very good. So here are four languages that have very good sets implementations. Actually, one of them is not a language, uh, is uh, the .NET runtime. The .NET uh, API has this a a interface. But these are, these, are function these are languages that have sets and that support whole set operations, like the intersection of two sets. Okay? Some other languages, like for instance, Java and JavaScript, don't have natively whole set operations. The set operations that they have is, they all always involve one element and a set. But they don't have operations that involve two sets. And that's, what, that's where it gets really powerful, to be able to compute the intersection of sets, the union of sets, and so on. Okay? So that's why the, the, the cat is crying there. And then in the case of Go, the cat is angry because not only, there's just no set, okay? There's no set in the standard library of Go, you have to find a set implementation. So in Python, you can do set operations using uh, infix operators like that, okay? And this allows you to do more complicated operations like, for instance, to show, demonstrate the, Mer the Morgan's law. See, this is a whole expression underneath here, done with set operations, okay? Imagine writing that with method calls. It's going to be a line one meter long, right? And, it, and harder to read, too. Anyway, so, Sets are interesting, it's interesting to study sets, but there is a, a, a problem. I, I'm going to skip, this is a whole list of, of the methods here. You can uh, take a look later, but the thing is, the set implementation in Python is written in C, so it's not so easy to read the source code. But I created an example inspired by a, a, a Go book. I was reading this excellent Go book, the Go programming language, and in that book, they implement a, a special kind of set, which is a set that holds only integers. And the way it works is instead of using a hash table like most sets use in, in programming languages, uh, it, it uses an array of words where each bit in the array represents the presence or the absence of a number in that position. Okay? So it's a bit vector. For example, this set of numbers can, implement, can be represented in Python, and I'm going to, uh, yeah, I, I won't be able to show the, imp the whole implementation, but this can be represented as this integer, okay? Python has long integers, right? Uh, why, what's the relationship between this and that? The relationship is this. Take a look, for instance, the last two numbers there, 288 and 290, are two even numbers. And you have here, this is the 290 and this is the 288. See, the first number is 13. So you have 12 zeros and then 13 and 14, see, 12 zeros, 13 and 14. So each one here is telling you that there is a, this number is part of the set. The index of the bit tells you whether that number is part of the set or not, okay? To contrast, this is a set that has only one number, and this is how it's represented. I'm going to do back and forth, so you can see kind of a, sorry, kind of a simple animation. See? Okay. Now, is this useful? Yes, it can be useful. Depend if, you're, if you're dealing with sets of numbers that are, the, the, the numbers are not very big, and you have a high density, because the operations are super fast with bits. I'm gonna uh, show you a little bit. There are some other examples here that show how different numbers are, different sets are, rep are represented. Uh, so the empty set is the number zero. 
And the set with the digit zero, with the number zero is the number one because it means that there is a one in the zero position. There is a zero in the one position. Uh, or there is a zero in the zero position. Yeah, that's what it means. Okay, now the interesting thing is I'm gonna show you the intersection operator, which according to those tables that I kind of skipped, the intersection, I can show. The intersection operation is, uh, implemented with the com uh, commercial E, and that's the Dunder end method, okay? So here is the code for the intersection. This is an example of operator overloading in Python. So in order to have the commercial E, the ampersand, the ampersand uh, character, work as an operator, you need to implement the under end method that will get uh, the object, which is the left-hand side operand, and the other object is the right-hand side operand, okay? So I get the class, because I'm going to be using the class here, then I, I, I check. If the other is an instance of this same class, then I will do the operation. Otherwise, I will return not implemented. This is a special value. I don't have a lot of time to explain the mechanism of uh, operator overloading, but it's really nice. If you've never played with it, try to play, uh, to, to study how operation overloading works in Python. But this is the interesting part here. The bits, the underscore bits field is actually just one number. It may be a big number, but it's just one number. And the intersection is implemented by doing a bitwise end between the two numbers, and that's it, right? So this is super fast. Uh, <clears throat> and if you want to read the code, the code is on GitHub. That's where you can find it. And this whole mechanism uses, uh, this, the, the mechanism of, of operator overloading uses a mechanism called double dispatch, which is super elegant. I don't have time to explain it, but I just want to show it to you because if you study it, you will find this is a beautiful thing, okay? Uh, okay, now that I, I talked a for a while about a pretty complicated subject, which is operator overloading, let's talk about something much simpler, which I also think is a beautiful thing in the design of Python which is the philosophy of fail fast. And this philosophy has to do with three lines of the Zen of Python that I'm gonna talk about. So the first one is errors should never pass silently. So what does that mean? For instance, there's, some, there, there, there's a language that I will not mention, okay, that has this stupid idea of an undefined value. This is the silliest mistake somebody can make when creating a language, okay? Because it has, it has severe consequences of creating bugs that are hard to find. So in Python, there is no concept of undefined. If you, if you try to use, an, uh, for instance, the B variable in an expression and you never created the B variable, you get name error, right? If you have a string, and this is very interesting because in Python, the, the one element of a string is a full Unicode character. Other languages that I will not mention don't have this property. When you get a, a proposition in a, in a string, Python 2 was like that too. That's, that's the main reason why, not the main reason, but probably one of the most important reasons why there was the migration from Python 2 to Python 3 was to fix this problem. Some other languages, when you get uh, a position from a string, you only get uh, uh, a byte and not a full character. But Python does it correctly, gets the full character for you. But anyway, if, you, if I try to reach the, the index tree, there is no index tree, and instead of, having, of getting none or undefined, what you get is an error. So this is much better for you as a programmer, right? There is also no surprising new values from dicts. Some other languages that I will not name have this property that when you try, try to find 
a, a, diction, a, a key in a dictionary and the key doesn't exist, it will return undefined. And there's another language that I actually like very much, that I, but I will not mean, name, that returns new, no, new or none. And I think this is wrong. Python has the best behavior, which is just raise an error. But Python, there's another part that says, errors should never pass silently unless explicitly silenced. This is important. So what does this mean? That the, part, the language provides another mechanism, which is to use the get method. If it's convenient in a particular context to get a new value or some kind of default value instead of an error, then just use get. Then that allows you to be explicit. When you're, sh when, when, when you're writing code to get, to get values from a dictionary, and it would be an error, it would be an exception if the value is not, if the key not, is not in the dictionary, then it's better to have an exception. On the other hand, if it's okay, then you can use get. Again, uh, I can do this, this, the, the, this, the second example in Python raises an exception because there are more values on the right hand side, right? Some other languages just silently discard the extra values. And maybe this is hiding a bug. But in Python, if you want to ignore excess values, you can use star, right? To capture the excess, okay? Also, we don't have surprising results for when you concatenate, when you, when you try to add a string to, the, to a number, you get an error. Right, because some other languages that I will not mention, what, what happens here? Do we get a string two eight, or do we, have the, do we get the number 10? It, it actually depends on the order of the arguments, so that's silly. The best way to, do, to deal with this is to raise an error because of this line of the Zen of Python. In the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to get, okay? So I talked about things that, were that are pretty complicated, like iterators and operator overloading. And Python has even more complicated stuff that is really interesting to learn, like metaprogramming, meta classes, descriptors, and so on. But also, Python is a very approachable language to start learning. And that's why I wrote in my book that I haven't yet found a language that manages to be easy for programmers practical for professionals and exciting for hackers in the way that Python is. Thank you, Guido von Hossung and everybody else that makes it so. Now, besides technical things, it's great the community of Python. In fact, the, the community of Python is so great that there is this phrase that became famous and it was adopted as the t-shirt for PyCon, PyCon Pune 2017, which is came for the language, stayed for the community. I illustrated this presentation with photos from a, a friend, Julio Melanda, from the Brazilian Python uh, conference. I'm uh, using here also some slides about diversity from Sujin Lee from, the, from uh, Korea. She spoke at PyCon Korea last year. And one of the things that she showed that I, uh, it was interesting, Guido, when he gives keynotes, always uses this T-shirt. The t-shirt says, uh, Python is for girls. And I actually saw him using that in 2013. And it, oh no, actually 2012 I saw him using that. And the t-shirt was already old by that time. So probably he started using it a long, long before, okay? In order to show how important he thinks it, it is that we open space for, for more women in our community, uh, at PyCon US in 2014, during the keynote, he answered questions only for we from women. Because he said, I've been walking uh, around the conference and I, I, I get lots of men coming to me and asking questions, so I think the women need a chance and I'm going to answer only questions from women during the keynote. And finally, in to since 2017, we have uh, a, a core developer of Python who is a woman, the first woman. There's a, now another one. In the Brazilian Python conference that's going to be in October, we have 
six keynotes and four of them are women. Okay? I want to wrap up by talking a little bit about elegance and coming back to this topic of, of, of uh, beauty. Okay? There's a quote in my book from uh, the creator of Jaiton where he talks about the sense of aesthetics that Guido has, which is very interesting. And there's a friend of mine from the Python community, a guy that I met at PyCons, Bruce Echo. He's the author of several books, but he loves Python. He, he, he never wrote a book about Python yet, but he loves Python. And actually, the tools that he used to write the books for other languages are tools written in Python. Okay? And he designed a t-shirt for PyCon US 2009. The design of the t-shirt was this. In the middle here, big. This is a painting that he gave me recently that he photographed to make the t-shirt, okay? I don't know if you can recognize this, but this is this, okay? And this is one of the was of the Yijing. It's a, a, a hexagram called, translated as grace in, by some books and some other books translated as elegance. So the t-shirt that uh, Bruce designed had this text, elegance begets simplicity. I think this is a extremely, an extremely elegant form. It looks like a very modern thing, doesn't it? It doesn't look like it has 3,000 years old, right? It looks like the very modern logo of a company today. And this is the most modern game that I know about. So that's what I wanted to talk about. And uh, wrapping up, Shen Shen. Oh, thanks, Luciano. Would you mind to give people uh, two chance to ask question what they care about? Okay, okay how we have two questions, and then we can ask you Okay, if you I know Python is very beautiful, but uh, I want to know what's the performance penalty for Python, uh, for Python beauty. Okay, well, here's the thing. Uh, performance is always a price that you pay. It's an engineering's choice, right? You need to, if you want to, to have more productivity, then you need to use a higher level language. And a higher level language is always, has always, uh, does, is not as performant, all right? But that doesn't mean you, you cannot do big things with Python. You know that Instagram was written in Python and YouTube is written in Python too. So uh, it's a matter, the, 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 the performance of the language is not as important as the architecture of the system. And the fact that Python is so powerful and has so many high-level features like sets and so on means that you can produce your solution faster. And a critical factor of success is time to market, right? So that's the advantage that Python gives you. It's time to market. Of course, if you want more performance, you can write in Go. But you're going you're, you're gonna, to uh, spend more time writing in Go, um, and especially if it has to do with machine learning. Then there is just no comparison. Okay? And also, since I mentioned machine learning, machine learning, most of the computation in machine learning in Python is actually done in libraries written in C and Fortran. So, yeah. Uh, uh, do you think a stronger or more sophisticated type system could uh, prevent uh, bugs for Python? Yes, uh, so uh, what we are seeing is uh, the introduction in Python of a mechanism for declaring types and checking types using libraries like MyPy. The companies that are developing the typing infrastructure of Python are companies that have hundreds of thousands or millions of lines of Python code. So yes, having a static typing does help with uh, preventing bugs and also does help with uh, uh, IDEs like uh, JetBrains to, to help the, use, the, the, the programmer better. 
but it also makes the language harder to learn for, for kids. So you have to know when to use something, okay? Thank you very much. Cheng Cheng. Let's give a round of applause for Cheng Cheng.